take your Bibles tonight and go to 2 Timothy, please. Turn to 2 Timothy. There's a study in Abundant Living which I wrote many years ago entitled Keeping Your Spiritual Deposit Account Alive. If you have not read it, it might be very, very beneficial to you this week after my teaching tonight to get a copy of this and take it home and ferret it out. Because if the Word of God lives within your heart and you have the accuracy of that Word within your heart, and you know what I mean by the heart is the renewed mind, uh, the seat where your personal life operates from, then it gives you a certainty and an assurance and a guarantee which is not built upon what men say, but upon what the Word of God says. If the Word of God is wrong, class, we have nothing anyway. And, but we do not believe it's wrong, we believe it's right. So this little booklet, it will be, it, it was taken from the light that I have on 2 Timothy, where I'm going to be dealing tonight. The reason I want to deal with 2 Timothy, and it's increasingly becoming a pressure on my mind, to share with our people more of the walk, the day-by-day -day living, how to conduct yourself and how to present the Word. Because many of you people who come here Sunday night after Sunday night as young people, as young married people, and as adults all the way through, you're really concerned about teaching the Word. You are concerned about handling this Word of God rightly divided, but to present it efficaciously, beautifully, positively, with all the greatness that that Word has around you. And if I can help you by teaching you the Word and showing you men of God and how they operate it, then we take off in our walk from the revelation given to thee. These epistles that Timothy set before the believer exactly how a man of God is to operate who has the Word of God ministering among people. These two epistles of First and Second Timothy comprise what I believe is the basic teaching in the Word of God regarding the ministry that men have in the bodies, and there are only five ministries, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, Timothy was a protege of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul led him to the Lord. The Apostle Paul saw him saved. He saw him filled with the Spirit. He saw the boy grow, the young man to grow, in knowledge of the Word. It, Timothy accompanied the Apostle Paul. He carried his suitcase. He traveled with him. He got him his tea when he needed it, perhaps, or his whatever you call them. I call them cookies. I forget what you call them, Australia and England. But whenever, whenever he needed anything, Timothy was there. And Timothy was like a brother to Paul. And I understand a lot of the epistle of Timothy that Paul wrote to him because to find people who stand with you really through thick and thin. You can find anybody stand with you for a week or two. But to find someone that will just stand faithful week after week, month after month, year after year, and just stay put if all hell breaks loose, that kind of a person you can't easily forget. Matter of fact, you never forget them. And Timothy was this kind of a man to the Apostle Paul. And when the Apostle Paul had a revelation, he, let it, he allowed him to stay at a certain place, and then he would write back to him and would tell him exactly what to do. And as he wrote back to him, he wrote by revelation, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, and that has given to us how I believe I must operate in the ministry. It has given to me the word that I teach to my people as to how I believe you must operate when you meet people and when you hold forth the wonderful word of God. In the first verse of the second epistle, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. He always gives his credentials. Isn't that something? Telling old Timothy, whom he loved with all his heart, that when he writes to him, he writes it this way. 
all sense knowledge wise would not have done it you know why because why should he timothy knew it timothy knew all this why did he write it because the revelation father told him you write paul an apostle of jesus christ so paul sits down and writes it by the will of god according to the promise of life which is in christ jesus to timothy my dearly beloved son not just a beloved son but very what dearly beloved son mercy and peace from god the father and from christ jesus our lord i thank god whom i serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing i have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day greatly desiring to see thee he was lonesome for him being mindful of thy tears that i may be filled with joy you see the great apostle paul no matter how much revelation he had of all that abundance of revelation he still enjoyed the fellowship of someone who loved him someone who could bless his heart just to sit there with him and that's why that's a tremendous thing that i may be filled with joy that the thing may really tell on the inside he says, when I call to remembrance, verse 5, the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, then in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded it's in you also, in thee also. You see, people, if we want to get God's word out, we've got to get the family. If, it, if the family believes God's word, then the family teaches it to the children, the children teach it to their children. That was the way the word was designed. But today, there are so few families having an accurate knowledge of God's word that you have to do exactly what the way ministry is doing. You try to reach as many adults as you can. They, in turn, can teach it to their children. But as soon as possible, you get those children in the classes and you teach them the word, too, like we do down here on Sunday night when you bring your children. That's the only way we can get to it. And you've got to today take the word of God to the young people because many parents are fossilized. They're dead and gone as far as be having a desire to really know God's word, but the young people are still hungry. And this is why you've got to direct the vast proportion of our ministry today specifically geared to young people. said wherefore verse 6 I put thee in remembrance I remind you Timothy that you stir up the gift of God to stir it up you women ought to know what it is to stir up stuff I don't mean your husbands I mean pots and things you put in them you know <laughs> I love you ah. stir up the ministry now that really the gift of God that really disturbed me I couldn't for the life of me see why it was given because one time in my life I was also taught that I was to be controlled possessed and just allow God to work through my life well if you're just taught that then there's no reason in stirring it up because he's going to stir it whenever he gets ready right and that's what people many times believe about receiving the Holy Spirit. Whenever God gets ready, he'll make you speak in tongues. Well, if anything ever makes you speak in tongues, you better come to way headquarters and let us get rid of whatever made you do it. Because it'll be the wrong God. That's right. He says, I want to remind you, stir it up. Stir it up. Stir it up. Stir up the gift that is in you. The gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hand this gift of God was the ministry one of the five ministries of apostles prophets evangelists teachers that's the gift of God that's what he said to him now stir it up let's say that God would call me to be a teacher if I don't stir up the ability to teach if I don't renew my mind if I don't think teaching I could never effectively teach. That's what it means to stir it up. You use it. 
You put forth the effort. You drive yourself at that thing. That's what I said to you this morning in the 1030 fellowship. You dream these things. I'm telling you, Phil. You dream it. You eat it. You sleep it. You wake with it. You just dream it. You picture it in your mind. You see, like when I walked into this service on Sunday night, I've been agitating my mind all day long, maybe more than that, preparing myself to come in here. And I see you people here. I dream in my mind. I call it dreaming, but it's constructive type. I visualize. I see what the meeting is. I see what how I can help my people. And then I just discipline myself to teach. Just stir it up. Well, man, if you want to move the Word of God, you've got to get stirring it up. <laughs> you got to... It isn't going to come in our day and time unless you talk about it. <laughs> One of the fellows said they had asked for a job someplace in the area, and they said, okay, so-and-so maybe, but if you get a job over here, we don't want you to evangelize. That's great. You see, while you're working on a job, if you haven't got time to speak to your neighbor, you stay put and give that man a good job. But when you're sitting in the restroom or in the lunchroom or any other place on your time, you can evangelize all you want. And if you don't, there's something wrong with you not getting stirred up. <laughs> Imagine. That's exactly what they said to the Apostle Paul. They said, here comes this, this fellow who's turning the world upside down. Oh, blabbermouth, you know. He's coming in here again. And he said, we don't want any of that evangelism in our community. Book of Acts, remember? Huh, did that deter Paul? That just turned him on. Because when men said they don't want to be evangelized, when they don't want to hear the word, that's the very fellow that needs it. Because if he had the right stuff, he'd be praising God that somebody wants evangelized. Well, Paul said to old Timothy, you get it stirred up. Get that ministry stirred up. Work that ministry. Present that ministry. Hold it forth. And by the stirring up, he means the whole presentation of that ministry. Well, by the putting on of my hands, simply corroborates what we know as revelation when a man is ordained to the ministry, the ordination will include the laying on of hands and the word of prophecy, and the prophecy will corroborate the ministry that's in that man, and that's what he said, stir it up. For God, verse 7, God hath not given us the spirit of what? But of power and of love and of a sound what? That's right. Anytime we have an unsound mind, in any category, it cannot be, it cannot be from the true God. The spirit of fear is really a spirit of cowardice, is the text. God has not made us cowards. Somebody says, I can't evangelize, so I'm a coward. I don't evangelize. Somebody says, I can't speak the word of God over here. I'm a coward. No, 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 no. God never meant for his people to take a back seat. He meant for God's people to stand up and declare God's word and say, Thus saith the Lord. But say it lovingly, but say it with both. That's right. He has given us power, love, and he's given us a sound mind. The only way I can have a sound mind is to the end I have the word of God rightly divided and live that word of God in manifestation. You've got to have a sound mind. Anybody that's off on God's word hasn't got a sound mind. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> Verse 8 says, Be not thou therefore ashamed, never be ashamed of the testimony of our what? Lord. Right. People have said at times, well, why do you want to speak in tongues in a meeting? New, some new person comes in here, they'll be offended maybe, or you'll drive them away. Well, if the word of God and the word of truth drives people away, you know, I 
impossible because the word says they that hunger and thirst after righteousness are going to be what? Filled. But it's a trick of the devil. Somebody wrote the other week, I guess, and they wanted to take some of my tapes and take some things out of it, ask if they could erase some of it because they figured it would offend somebody that they were going to bring in. Well, bless their heart. Uh, the word of God may be offensive to people who are not hungry. That's right. But those of us that are hungry, the word of God's our life. It's our soul. It's that which has turned us on. It's that which makes sense. It's the only thing that makes sense. It says, verse 9, who has saved us, who has saved us, the Lord who has saved us, and called us with a what? Holy calling, not according to our work, but according to his own purpose and what? Grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the Lord. Amen. Isn't that tremendous? Given us the believers in Christ Jesus before the world began because of the foreknowledge of God. But is, made, is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who hath abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher, a witness, and an apostle, and a teacher of what? You have two of the ministries mentioned of the Apostle Paul in that verse. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know, I know, not question, not doubt, I know, that I know, that I know, that I know, that I know, I know in whom I have what? Believe. And I am persuaded beyond a shadow of a doubt. Boy, when you reach that place that you know, that you know, that you know, that you know, and that you're persuaded beyond a shadow of a doubt, nobody turns your head. Just no. Nobody gets you to get off of the ball. The reason we get off the ball the reason we get out in left field is because we are not fully persuaded. We know that it has tickled our spiritual palate. We know that it has set us free, but we are not fully persuaded beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is the only way it could possibly be. Well, the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, he said, I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And there is the great error in translation. I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which. That which are the words, my deposit. Keep that with are the words, my deposit. The rest of the translation is, which he has committed unto me. Which he has committed unto me. In 1 Timothy, chapter 6, in verse 20, you have the same word. O Timothy, keep that which. The word keep that which are the words guard the deposit. Guard the deposit. O Timothy, guard the deposit that's committed to thy trust. That's why in the 12th verse of the second epistle, 
Paul says, by revelation, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep my deposit. He, God, is able to keep my deposit. He's able to keep it, which he has committed unto me. He is, God is able to keep that deposit, but the usage of it, the manifestation of it, the stirring up of it, he has committed unto who? me. What a tremendous revelation in God's word. You see, the deposit, all of this which was committed to him was the revelation of the mystery. God in Christ in you, the hope of glory, that we are fellow heirs and of the same body. That was the deposit. Now that deposit is committed unto us to keep. It is our job to stir up the ministry. It is our job to stir up the gift, to carry that deposit forth that others may see. What a tremendous thing. I don't think I turned you on yet on this thing. This is terrific. Imagine. You make a deposit at the bank. Who guards that deposit? Well, they put it in a vault of some kind that's pneumatically sealed or something and only opens at 8 in the morning with an electronic dew of some kind. But that's not all on the guarding of that deposit. The bank president, the board of directors are responsible. Not, that is not all. The government of the United States ensures that deposit. Well, how much more our God? He, God, is able to surely keep our what? Deposit. He is able to keep that deposit, but he has entrusted it unto me. That's why he said, guard thou the deposit in verse 20 of first of chapter 6, but over here in 12 he says, he is able to keep my deposit which he has committed unto me. The usage is committed unto us. It will come up a little later and I'll show it to you again. Verse 13, hold fast, hold fast, receive how? Right. And after you have received that wonderful word of God, what do you do? Hold it fast. You just don't let anybody talk you out of it, for I know and am persuaded beyond a shadow of a doubt. Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing, and the word thing is the word deposit. <laughs> that good deposit, that great mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Salvation by works, no. Salvation by grace, not of works, lest any man should want. That's right. That good deposit, which was committed unto me, unto thee, keep, 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 by Panuma Hagion, which dwelleth in us. The word keep is the word same word as in 620, where he said, O oh, Timothy, what? Keep. Same word. It simply means guard. Guard the deposit. Committed unto thee, guard by or keep by Panuma Hagion, which dwelleth in us. What a wonderful revelation. You see the mystery. The great mystery, that one that the first edition, Howard said, had parts missing. And by the way, all of you people who bought a copy, remember what Peter said, we're going to give you 
want to replace it tonight. So if you got a copy, you go back to Imogene back there at the book table. She'll give you a copy. It had parts missing. Well, this great deposit, the mystery, had no parts missing, which was God in Christ in you, all of those things that we teach you in the foundational class that we read to you from the Word. This, he says, keep. That's the deposit. Now, that, he says, keep, guard, buy, Panuma Hagion's the key. How are we going to keep it? The word keep does not mean that you can lose it because it's eternal life you could not want. Therefore, to keep it is not because you lose it, but utilize it. By utilizing it, then you're guarding it, then you're keeping it. Look, I have an arm. I tie it up in a sling. Am I keeping it? Yes, I am. I'm still going to have the arm left. That's one usage. But here, now, I do this. I get those things go like that, like that. Now I'm what? I'm keeping it. I'm guarding. That's the word to keep or guard. Does it mean protect to the end that you're going to lose it? In other words, you don't guard it by setting up machine guns around it. You guard it you, by its utilization. That's why he said to him, I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep my deposit which he has trust entrusted to me. He is able to keep it, but I also have a responsibility of what? Guarding it by Panuma Hagion, by the operation of the nine manifestations of the Spirit. That's what exercises my spiritual arm. That's how I guard this deposit and keep it. That's what he taught. Which dwelleth in What a tremendous thing. In verse 15, is really a sad note to the church of his day, as well as to ours, perhaps. You'll remember in Acts chapter 19, all Asia heard the word of God in how long a period of time? Two years and three months. Now, it's getting toward the close of Paul's presence here upon earth, and he's writing by revelation to Timothy. And by the time the apostle Paul passed away, the light on the great mystery was lost. With the exception of the few men who had faithfully stood with Paul and to whom he ministered the word, and that he wrote it down, and it circulated among the churches and has come down to us in the revelations given in Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Thessalonians. That's why he says, Thou knowest, verse 15, that all they which are in Asia be turned away what? from me. That great man of God, the Apostle Paul, there must have been something that turned those people away from him besides his personality, besides the fact that he ate garlic, or besides the fact that he had three o'clock afternoon tea every afternoon. There must have been something that turned all Asia away from that great man of God. And it can only be when you work the word, Satan blinding the eyes of the born-again believer. Satan doesn't have to work on the man outside of the pale because he's already got him hooked. But Satan has to work on the people who are born again to blind their eyes so they become men and women of good work. Promulgating all the water baptism, all the other stuff, all the feasts, everything that goes with it so that you lose the greatness of salvation by grace and the ineffable presence of his Holy Spirit and the utilization of the nine manifestations. And that's exactly what happened if you'll read the epistles. The Judaizers were following Paul around. The legalists were following him around and Satan was using those multitudes of leaders and saying, well, after all, there are 5,500 over here that say this and you, Paul, and Timothy say that. That's two against 5,500. 
the two got to be wrong, the rest of the organization is right. And so people, instead of standing faithful on God's word, allowed Satan to give them a spirit of slumber. And they became blind to the great revelation. And by the time the apostle Paul died, all Asia had turned away from the greatness of that revelation. We're back in circumcision, back in water baptism, back in keeping the feast, back in going at a certain hour to prayer and all that other stuff. That the gospel of the revelation of the new birth, the power of the Holy Spirit has set them free from. Isn't it something how people always like to go back, so many people like to go back to the old hog country they came from where they had nothing to eat except corn husk? It can only be a trick of Satan. When we want to go back to something less than we are now. And yet that's exactly what a sad note this must have been. Peter, uh, Timothy knew it, but for Paul to write it by revelation is almost unbelievable to me. That that great man of God, whose revelation was beyond anything anybody had ever received, whose ministry was just par excellence, second to none, all Asia heard the word of God, and yet, before his death, all Asia had turned against him. Well, he says in chapter 2, verse 1, after he goes into rescue and stuff, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in what? The rest of the people weren't. And writing this by revelation in the last years of his life, he said to Timothy, but you, my son, don't get shook over the good work, boys, and all the rest of them. He said, we got salvation by grace. You just stand strong in the grace which is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same, Timothy, you commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Isn't that something? Faithful men. Faithful men. Remember what the gospel says about a steward? A steward's a good steward if he's what kind of steward? Faithful. God needs faithful men, women, who will stay put on God's word and not be blown about with every wind of doctrine or kick the traces every other week. Men and women who stand for the greatness of God's word. And he said, then you endeavor to commit this to faithful men who are able to teach others old. That's exactly what we're trying to do in the way men. Trying to commit this word to faithful men and women who are able to teach others old. Able to teach others old. And boy, when you teach Keep it simple. Remember what Tremendous Jones says, keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> but keep it simple. K-I-S-S. -S. I think that's the way he taught it. He said, just remember being kissed. Keep it simple, stupid. So, most of the people who want to teach want to impress you with the knowledge they have of God's word and how much they know, that's not the idea. The idea of the teaching ministry is keep it simple. You don't have to impress me or anybody else with how much you know. We all know that you know him who knows it. And you'll know, know enough of the word in its simplicity that you can teach it simply. And what the people need is not a complicated, a difficult teaching. They need simple teaching. It is, it's more difficult for a teacher to teach simply than it is for a teacher to double talk and triple talk that nobody knows what he's talking about and everybody believes he's fantastic. Except when you try to put it to work. Then it doesn't work. Then. It sounded so beautifully, you know. Great vocabulary, great everything else, but it's just triple talk, double talk, quadruple talk, and when you get through, you can't work it. Simplicity is the key to teaching. You've got to teach it so simple 
that even a child can't miss it. And this is what he's saying. Able to teach others also. Now, the word able is rooted in the word enablement. The manifestations of the Spirit are our enablement to minister that deposit efficaciously. And we are to commit this word to faithful men who are have enablement, who are able to minister others own. Isn't that lovely? What a beautiful, wonderful ministry God's given. Thou therefore endure hardship as a good soldier of what? Jesus Christ. Let me read you verse 4 and close with it tonight. We are good soldiers of Jesus Christ, and no man who warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this what? Isn't that something? And I think at one time in my life I was just about as entangled as any person could be. And to be set free of that entanglement, to have such wonderful freedom is just the God-given ability then latent within a person that he can put into practice and he can carry out the ministry. How many times people get entangled with the affairs of this life and they get so entangled, they love the Lord, but they can't ever do anything really for him because they're so entangled in life that they just can't get out and really do what God wanted them to do. See, that we may please him who has chosen him or us to be what? Soldiers. We have been chosen to be what? Soldiers. And our work is to please him. That's why we can't get entangled in the affairs of this life. We've got to move fast and far, which means we've got to move light. We can't be encumbered with all kinds of things that hold us back. Where every week I've got to have so much for my insurance policy. I've got to have so much to pay for the washing machine. I've got to have so much to pay on the house. So much to lay aside for, for taxes. So much to pay off on the automobile. So much for the TV. People, it just drives you nuts. It'd be better for us to go back to the old washboard or wear dirty clothes. I don't know. A lot of these things. But this is the word. Now, I know our society laughs at us. Our times laugh at us. But people, those of us who are laughing at it, are we really getting any results? Are we out there really witnessing? Are we bringing power? Or are we really encumbered? Are we really enslaved? Maybe we're laughing at people who are setting themselves free of a lot of the encumbrances and say, okay, not to it. If we have to, we'll do it less. But we're not going to be enslaved in this life any longer. We're going to learn to walk in the freedom and the power that God has made available. I think it's a tremendous time, people. And when God really puts this kind of stuff on your heart, really puts it there, it changes the life of a man or woman. I was going to read a phrase from this book, and now I can't find it, and Father says it's good, it's hidden, so you read it. But it's in there, and that keeping our spiritual deposit account alive is my responsibility. If I did not believe to operate the ministry that God has given me, it'd go, I'd go flat on my face. The light on God's word would never shine because God, the true God, has committed himself to men and women that they carry the word. He could have raised up stones and had them cry out, but he didn't choose stones. As a matter of fact, he didn't even choose angels. He could have chosen angels to declare this wonderful mystery and the greatness of the word, but he didn't. He chose you and he chose me. In that second chapter, I think if you read down a little further, it tells about the different kind of vessels in a house. Remember? Some vessels do this, some vessels do that. Some for more honor, some for less honor. Simply means that certain vessels in a home 
are used to anoint a person with, other vessels are used to wash their feet. And he's simply saying, they're all kind of vessels, but what you've got to lift yourself up to is you get to be the vessel that pours the blessing on people. Let somebody else wash the feet. You know, and that kind of thing. That's right. Because when God commits to you the deposit, you are the one that brings the fresh wine, the glory of his divine presence. You are the one that brings the love to God's people. You are the one whose very presence blesses them because you're there. Because you're positive, you're loving, you're kind, you're believing. That's what, why God has given us the privilege of living in this day and time and hour to hold forth his wonderful matchless word. Now, does anybody want to ask a question about Second Timothy chapter 1? I don't do this too very often on Sunday night anymore. Well, I guess there's a reason. Isn't it a wonderful chapter? Like all the word, always wonderful. It always blesses a man's heart, a woman's heart, because it's that kind of thing we need so that we can be wonderful ambassadors for him, carrying forth the greatness of that word.